what we're going to see is that the the network characteristics and the spatial characteristics are mostly independent, they're mostly orthogonal, except in two very important cases within any logic where they influence each other. But for the most part, you can think about two different classes of characteristics being specified from the environment. The topology of the network, who's connected with whom, and the spatial layout, which also impacts the visual layout. Okay. Um, so, um, spatial layouts determine where nodes appear in space and on the screen, um, and networks, who, who's connected with who. For the most part, they're, they're determined um, independently. Network topologies can be defined uh, either in, in addition to or alternative to spatial layouts. In any case, agents will have a spatial location. They will have some spatial location you model that will determine where they're to be displayed, among other things. But the network topology can be provided uh, atop of that. So let's talk, ooh, I don't know why this is not showing up um, as, as having a uh, display here for Neil. So let me just uh, stop this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of restart this sharing. Okay, here we go, share, okay. Um, okay, so network types uh, can be a variety of built-in network types or you can set your own. It turns out it's very easy to build up your own networks within any logic. Mechanistically, it's quite easy to add connections in or delete connections. And that can be done dynamically. That can be done while the model's operating. But you can also just use a set of built-in networks. And those are very useful for quickly checking dependence of results on different network assumptions. And it turns out that these are important categories of networks because they exhibit quite different structure. And we're gonna really emphasize this a bit today. Um, briefly speaking, a random network, the first type, exhibits indiscriminate connection of individuals regardless, it doesn't pay any, it doesn't have any notion of, of, of locality. People are connected together in a random sort of way. Um, if I have a friend, my friend's connections are very independent of, of, of my own connections. There's really no, no recognition of the fact that, you know, if I'm in the real world, if I'm friends with someone, we have a lot of friends in common. There's no locality, there's no sense of, of uh, there's a set of people near both of us. Random network is, is in some ways the simplest possible type of network Two people are connected with a certain problem. Any two people are connected with a certain probability. Doesn't consider uh, the characteristics of any of their friends. A ring lattice, by contact, uh, by contrast, is an extremely local network. You're connected with neighbors, and those neighbors are only connected with their neighbors, and it exhibits enormous locality. A, sm a small world network is a mixture between those two, between a random network and a ring lattice network. A scale-free network is a, is a type of network of great theoretical interest and in which is shown to capture a lot of important features of socio-technical, human, and purely technical systems. Um, scale-free networks, for example, are, are seen in the structure of the internet. Who's connect, what sites are connected with what other sites and also in human populations, how many, um, the, the structure of, of human networks. There's some individuals who have many, many connections, but most individuals have fewer connections. In the internet, some places have many, many connections and others have few. And there's a reason for this. Scale-free networks are built up using processes that, that tend to favor those with the most connections already. So if there's a site that has lots of connections already, another site is likely to, more likely to come across it and put a link to it. And so to those with a lot of connections goes other connections. If your site is already linked to a lot, it will come up earlier in Google, in Google search results, which will lead to more people coming to your site, which in turn leads to it being 
more highly ranked among other sites and and in Google um, Google search results. So so it tends to favor those who have a lot of connections already. And finally, there's a distance-based network, which we're already using, in fact, um, which is in fact the default, I believe, which where basically you have um, uh, you have uh, th nodes being collect connected together if they're located nearby. Okay, so um, somewhat independently of this, you have layout types. Well, actually, quite independently. And this has to do with, okay, given that you have a network, how do you lay it out? It's not quite true, but um, that's almost true. Um, so with layout types, you can have a user-defined layout. This has to do with where people are located in space, or you can have a random layout, or you can have people's location be sort of arranged in a grid, in a ring, or in a way that takes into account who's connected with who. And it tries to locate people who are tightly connected nearby each other. Okay, so layout types and network types are two very important considerations here. Layout determines location. Network type determines connectivity. Okay, and there's two points of of connect of connection between the two, where they're not where they're not independent. Okay, so let's talk about the different types of networks. First of them I want to talk about is the last one I mentioned just now, which is distance-based networks. And the function here is capturing geographic locality in a network, locality in a 2D space. And here networks may be discontinuous or or they may be continuous. Discontinuous in the sense that they're divided into disjoint components. Components that, that are not connected. And this can occur when you're only connected with people very close distance, or the density of the space is too small. So if we have our model um, that, that we've built up in class, you'll notice that that exhibits discontinuous uh, network structure. So uh, individuals are connected with neighbors, but there's quite a few disconnected components. And if we went and we looked at that, at that uh, structure within our model, and we went and we looked particularly at the environment, and clicked on environment and went to the advanced tab, what you'll find is that you're using a distance-based network, and there's a connection range of 50. Let's suppose we wanted to increase that connection range. Um, uh, Neil, can you see my AnyLogic screen um, right now? Can you tell me? Or yes, sir, or, or, or no there. OK, uh, not right now. OK. Um, what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to try to uh, switch you over to that. Um, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll follow along something. So we're going to have a, a, a just a tiny bit of uh, fun here. At least it's fun for me. Um, hopefully it'll be fun for you. So what I'd like you to do is um, within within this AnyLogic uh, main class, I'm going to I'm going to have some fun adding in some some user interface elements. So from the palette, I'd like you to scroll down to where it says controls, and there's a slider there. I'd like you to drag the slider in. Okay. Drag this slider into the into the uh, element here. And this slider, I'd like you to call it um, uh, slider connection range. Okay. Um, and its minimum value be zero. Its maximum range make it 500. Um, the default value will be z uh, say say default value be 50. Okay. Um, whoa. Okay, something something just uh, happened with our application sharing there. So let me start that again. Um, and here we go. Oh. Okay. Um, so uh, and by default it's it's enabled, so we, we won't change that. Okay. And uh, what I'd like you to do now is in the environment. Well, here maybe what we'll do is have a a variable called. Um, uh, well, for simplicity, I think we'll actually just just have the environment directly coupled to that slider. Um, 
So down in environment, we're going to have the connection range here depend on slider connection range dot, and I think it's dot get value. Um, Maybe off about that, but uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, so I'm going to run this now. Oh, I seem to have lost it again. Oh, now I, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Um, okay. Uh, for some reason, this uh, application sharing is is exhibiting this function. Okay, here we go. Share it again. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do now is to run this, this model. So in short, we have a slider that I added called slider connection range. And now we're going to have the environment connection range depend on that. So this is the range at which people will be connected. So we're going to run this model. And we will see, OK, this is a certain um, range of connections. Now, I should have done one other thing. If we drag this, we actually won't see any change. What we have to do in order to see the change, I should have anticipated earlier, within, within the slider here is under the dynamic property, excuse me, under the just the general associate with the slider, we'll have to say apply, um, we'll have to say environment dot apply network. So we're telling the environment, hey, Go, go reapply your network type. Go recompute who's connected with whom, whom is connected with whom. So in the slider action, we need something that says environment.apply network. Okay? And if we do that, what we should see is, is a situation where we again have a slider, but, oh gosh, um, it's, it's, why is that not working? Should be um, it should be actually redoing that network type, but let's see what's going on here. Um, that, oh, okay, okay. Environment dot. Thank you. Dot set network all in range. And then the slider, thank you, Dylan. Uh, slider, or, or then I could just say get value. Well, no, I have to say slider connection range dot get value. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just yeah, do that. Okay. So, um, so I think uh, somehow this is uh, is going in and out for Neil. But let me. Um, Oops, let me just try this as an option. Alternatively, I'm sure the entire desktop. This may prevent us going back and forth. Okay, so uh, thank you, Dylan. Um, so we're to now run this, this same simulation. And I was hoping it would dynamically adjust, but I don't think it it does do that. Then it, it sounds like, oh, there we go. Oh. Okay, um, thank you, Dylan. Um, that's That's great. Okay, so. First of all, why are these things becoming so large? Anyone remember? Anyone want to guess? They're based on the connection number. This of it is based on the connection number. And based on this connection range, we're connecting fewer people or more people together. So in this case, we've actually seen how the network can be reformed with a broader set of connections together. And the larger we make this connection range, the more people are connected together, the, the further the distance over which they're connected. The two given individuals connected together if and only with their, their distance from, from one another is less than or I believe equal to, although I'm not sure about the equal to, that connection threshold. I was thinking, but I was incorrect, that this environment property associated under advanced for the environment was in fact dynamic, but in fact it seems it's not. It seems that static is used once to create the network, and then after that we have to set it. So folks, I changed this back to 50 for the network. For the slider, what we have is slider, the minimum value is 0, the maximum is 500, default is 50, 
and then you have this and these two calls to environment environment dot set network all in range with the the value of that slider and then then a call to apply the network and it will re re sort of reapply the network figure out what the network um, connections are accordingly so uh, so here the slider adjusts the network connectivity okay so let's let's keep on talking about this though um, uh, in this case it's important to know that for the distance based network location and network are not independent for the most part they're independent where you're located is 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 a different issue a separate issue from who you're connected to in this case who you're connected to is dependent upon where you're located right this is one way in which they're they're tightly coupled in fact one depends on the other so here we're setting connectivity we're setting connections we're cutting the network based on location based on layout okay um, so that's good and you'll notice once again that the connection range is, is key um, incidentally for those who who didn't follow it you'll notice in the environment here under advanced there's there's several fields down here for different types of networks the fact that most of them are grayed out. Why do you think most of them are grayed out? Can anyone tell me? They don't matter for distance-based Yeah, exactly. For distance-based network, this is the only one which matters. If we were to switch by contrast, and I'm, I'm just going to switch back, but if we were to switch to, for example, ring lattice network, connections per agent is relevant. A scale-free network, it's the network M parameter. But for distance-based network, it's the, it's the connection distance. Okay. So that's something um, people uh, may have missed at, at first. Okay, so now let's talk about ring lattices. So we, we talked about a distance-based network, which is designed to capture connectivity between individuals. Um, and indeed, if you look at human society, there's a lot of connecti connectivity between individuals who are located nearby. Evidence suggests that people nearby each other in a physical sense have a huge impact on people's the, the norms, the attitudes, the behaviors of others around them. And you may be very close in an emotional sense to someone who's far away, but the real um, strongest influences in terms of behavior seem to come from those located physically in proximity. We'll see how technology uh, changes uh, that, but the evidence suggests now, even with the rich technologies we have, it's still basically location is where it's at. Okay, let's talk about ring lattice though. This is a different sort of network. Here, we have purely local connectivity in a linear sense. We just have local connectivity for distance based in a two-dimensional sense. But here, we have uh, agents that are conceptually arranged in a ring. Okay? And connections by an a given agent to some number of agents are on either side of itself in a ring. So you're connected with others in this ring all around. And in this case, there's going to be slow propagation of infection. There's no shortcuts from one region to another. It's going to propagate slowly over it. And this is most naturally displayed with a certain type of layout. It can be run with any sort of layout, but it's most naturally displayed with a ring layout where people are arranged in a ring. So let's go from a distance-based network to a ring lattice. and and then let's let's go. Well, we could we could go see what it looks like right now when we simulate this. Oh gosh, we seem to have lost this um, lost this uh, thing again. Okay, there we go. We're sharing the whole desktop. There we go. Okay. Um, so now let's let's run this thing with just a ring lattice. What will happen? Well, this really isn't the best way to to display it. This is what we see. It's kind of like pick up sticks. People are connected in a ring lattice, you just can't see. Everyone's connected with one neighbor on each side. It's just not obvious because they're kind of scattered around in different locations. You'd have to really trace visually to sort of see, okay, this one's connected maybe with that, one, that one's connected with that, and then to verify they're in a ring. What's much nicer is, ladies and gentlemen, if you go within this environment, and again in the advanced tab, and you set not only the network type to be ring lattice, 
but you, you set it to be ring layout type. Now their location in, on the screen and in space, in fact, is going to be arranged in a ring. And this is what we see. Now there it's much clearer. Okay? And we have a situation where we may have infection, but it's spread to, to, relatively, to relatively few people. By the way, you can right click on this and, and drag it around to, to see things. In this case, I think our infection has died out. Now, I think we had said it, uh, no, um, maybe we removed that, to, to infect someone when we, um, when we click on them. But um, if you have infection come into this sort of network, it tends to spread very slowly because it has to go around in a very localized way around the, um, around the network, kind of like this. It spreads out from point to point to point around the network. And to get over to here, it has to work its way around in a very uh, linear fashion. Um, okay, so uh, let's let's uh, continue to oh, um, discuss uh, discuss aspects of the various network types. So we've talked about ring lattice. Let's talk about Poisson random networks now. Um, the evidence seems to suggest maybe it isn't um, isn't being shared again. Okay, so let's go back to Poisson random networks. Okay, um, with Poisson random networks, this is the type of highly global network I was talking about before. Whoa. Um, okay, yes. Um, highly global network we were talking about earlier. Here, what we have is the situation where any two nodes exhibit the same chance of connectivity as any other pair of nodes. So there's no preference for any sort of locality, no preference for your, your friends or similar to the friends of your, your, of, of your friend, um, that there's, there's sort of clustering in people. There's no more overlap in the connections of two neighbors than among two arbitrary nodes in the population. We have kind of these just mass connectivity in a, in a random sort of way. So what we're going to do here is, is go down and look at a random network within any logic. Um, so if we go, if we go to uh, environment here and we set the network type to be random, in that case we can, uh, sure, we'll set the, the layout type. Well, no, just keep it as ring. That, that'll be good. Keep it as a ring network. Let's, let's run this thing. So I'm going to go over and run it, run the simulation. And what we should see is a situation where we have this sort of uh, broad product connectivity. So here's an individual starting infected. And quickly, the infection is spread across the network. It's spread spatially across the network. Why does it spread so quickly? Why did it get over here so quickly compared to the ring lattice? With ring lattice, how would it get over here? It has to go all the way around a very painful inchworm sort of way. Here, there's a tremendous number of connections across the network. So quite soon after it starts, after it's introduced, it's spread broadly throughout the network uh, in, a, in a spatial sense. So there's this very wide, random mixing between individuals. It's static here. We could, we, we can and will have network, dynamic network connections soon. But right now it's a static sort of connectivity, but exhibits these global, this global sort of mixing between individuals, which almost ensures that it will quickly spread, spread around the network um, in, a, in a fairly short time. And what you'll find is that if you have an aggregate model, an SIR model, for example, which exhibits random mixing, a random network tends to approximate that quite well. Um, so the behavior of an infection over a random network is kind of similar to what you would see if you just had constant sort of churn and who contacts who without a lot of structure. So with random with random connections, things can spread very, very quickly. 
because of the global connections. The final sort of network I'm going to be talking about right now is a scale-free network. And once again, this is supported by any logic, although that less would like. So if you go advanced, once again, and you go free, what you find is that um, you can specify an M, an M parameter. What a, what a, a scale-free network is designed to capture is the fact that, that in real-world systems, whether they're human, technical, or some mix thereof, there's a tremendous amount of heterogeneity that's often exhibited. Um, and that heterogeneity is really, is really important often. So whether it's through spreading influence, through selling products, or spreading pathogen, someone with a high number of connections is often really, really important. They're important because they're more likely to be influenced by or infected by um, by one of their connections than others, and they're more likely to pass on that, or more, more likely or more able to pass on that information to others, to influence others. And uh, people have found in the health context that um, it's often these individuals who have large numbers of partners or connections that, that really allow an infection to stay in a, in a system where it would otherwise die out. We saw that within our SIR models, our aggregate models, if we had contact rates that were too small, what would happen? If, if you lowered the contact rate within an SIR model, such as you go for the problem set as, or as we built in class, if you kept on lowering it, what would eventually happen? Kept on lowering that contact rate and rerunning the model lower it some more, rerun it, what will eventually happen? Yeah, the infection at the point won't take off. And why won't it take off? Because it's too hard for a person to replace Yeah, great. So in, in mathematical terms, this, this uh, basic reproductive number, R0, becomes what? Less than one. And what that means is that the first infected, even if they're surrounded totally by susceptibles, they'll, on average, infect less than one person before they recover. So, again, by chance, they may infect one. Maybe they'll even infect two, but chances are those won't infect enough to keep it going. And so it'll tend to peter out. And so it is with influence as well. So it is with selling product or, or um, or, or changing, um, it, having innovation spread throughout a company. If there's too little contact, it can make the, all the world a difference for a die-out. It, it, it disappears. Now, what people have found, though, is that it's, it's not so neat. It's not so simplistic a pattern, or so simple a pattern. It's not that, that um, simple. That often there's great heterogeneity within a population. And there are certain subgroups that maybe the population as a whole has an average level of contact, which is not sufficient to keep the pathogen going. But maybe in certain sub-areas of the network, you do have enough contact, and it will live there. It will stay there. It will stay resident there, rather than disappearing entirely. And those individuals may then pass it on to others. Um, and it turns out that uh, using classic SIR models, and I used to teach this in this course, you can you could try to uh, characterize networks with uh, with heterogeneity. But a particularly interesting case is the case of scale-free networks. And and here, these networks exhibit a sort of scale-free property, sort of scale invariance, a self-similarity, which means that if you look at them with wider scales or smaller scales, you see the same patterns. So a node's, if we denote a node's number of connections with K, we, if we call K the number of, of sexual partners someone has had, or the number of websites to which a given site is connected, um, or the number of, of um, individuals with which someone has con come into contact with an uh, airborne transmission distance, the chance of having K partners is, or k connections, is proportional to k to the minus gamma. Okay. 
Okay, so we'll talk about some of the things that, uh, some of the implications of this, but the, um, the implication is that, for example, um, if, if uh, gamma equals two, doubling k, going from k to 2k, would, would mean that the proportion of people with 2k, 2k um, numbers of connections is just four times smaller than that with k. So if you consider double the number of connections, big difference in the number of connections, the chance goes down by four. Why four? Well, it's two to the two. Double the number of connections. Remember, it goes as k to the minus gamma. So if you go to 2k, it's If you go if you go from with k to the minus gamma, and if you go to two, if you consider so the, the probability is proportional to k to the minus gamma. So if now you consider two k to the minus gamma, what you have is k to the minus gamma times two to the minus gamma. And if if gamma is two, this would be two times two to the minus two, which is which is equal to k to minus 2 over 4. In other words, 4, a quarter of the probability of, of, as it were, for half the number of connections. So doubling the number of connections just lowers it. No matter how many connections you have, it just lowers it by that same amount. No matter how many connections we have, the fraction with people with, with twice uh, connections, or the fraction people with this many connections is four times the fraction with two times as many connections, okay? If gamma equals three, k divides by, by eight. And we call this a power law. And we say this exhibits power law invariance. It exhibits invariance to scale. So if we change our scale, we re re denoted how we count connections to be tens of connections or hundreds of connections, it would look the same. No matter how many connections we see, we, we see it exhibits these uh, these properties. And so this is this seems to be true for large areas of the network, uh, the internet, for example, in terms of connectivity. So sites with twice as many connections, there might be, you know, one quarter the number of them um, as there is with with k connections. So here we have very long tails. We might have most sites with relatively few connections, but some of massive numbers of connections, okay? Um, now, for human sexual networks, and indeed for quite a few socio-technological technological systems, gamma seems to be between 2 and 3.5 or something along those lines. There's this interesting uh, power law scaling. And this has been exhibited in, in many different different areas. This is for sexual partners over a two year period. And this this sort of log log graph, when we take the log of the, uh, the probability of the frequency on the one hand, and the log of the number of connections exhibits uh, a line. And the reason we see that, ladies and gentlemen, is because we have P of K, the probability of having K connections being proportional to K to the minus gamma, right? So if we take log of P of K on the left, this is, this is proportional to the log of K to the minus gamma here. And, you know, we'll have log of P of K proportional to, and if we have this, this is just minus gamma times log of K, right? Um, so if you take a log of A to the B, it's just A times log of, uh, excuse me, B times log of A. So, so here we have this sort of graph. We have log, this is log K, and this is log P, and we have a constant slope between them associated with gamma. So this is sort of the signature, the hallmark of, 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 uh, of this sort of log linear distribution. So this is slope of minus gamma. Um, it's going down as k goes up, and so minus sign. But the, the, the steepness of the slope uh, has to do with the relative size of uh, magnitude of gamma. Um, uh, and this is, this is from um, uh, 
from an article on, on human sexual behavior, but you could see, see similar patterns in, in other areas. So these scale-free networks have a lot of low degree nodes, a lot of nodes with relatively few connections, and some with extremely high connections. And these are of great interest because these are the sort of, of patterns that will lead to rapid dissemination because all it takes is someone with few connections to be connected with someone with high connections and then it will lead to massive dissemination really quickly from those high connected individuals. So all it has to do is be picked up by someone who's sort of a social butterfly or uh, someone who, is, who's, who brings it around to a lot of different people and an infection or an idea or a meme or what have you can spread quickly or a Twitter comment. So. So when you see this sort of scale-free behavior, it's a hallmark of, of great uh, heterogeneity, and it can, it can lead to profound differences in behavior of the system. We have situations where, in some sense, the tail wags the dog. The small numbers of individuals who are down here with larger numbers of connections far disproportionately affect whether an infection survives or not compared to the vast majority of people. And, and it's, it's those numbers of individuals down here that we call as belonging to core groups that we may target within our interventions as well. Um, I guess I should just say one, um, one final thing about a uh, final type of network, which is a small world network. A small world network is a combination of two extremes. It's a combination of the extreme of locality. What's the extreme of locality? What network type exhibited profound locality in a one-dimensional sense that we saw? Extreme locality. Things could only spread to our neighbor. The ring lattice, the ring lattice network. So a, a small world network is a combination, a weighted combination, a certain fraction of one, a certain fraction of the other, certain fraction of ring lattice, and what's the sort of network which exhibited utmost sort of global characteristics? It paid no attention to any sort of locality. It, what's that? A random network. Poisson random, it's sometimes called. Um, uh, it also goes to, uh, by several other names, uh, Bernoulli network, um, uh, Erdos random network. So a small world network is a weighted combination. There's, there's a certain parameter called P that dictates what fraction are local and what fraction are global. So if you were to look in any logic here and you were to look in the environment and you were going to go down to, to network type and look at small world, you'll notice there's now two parameters. For, for ring lattice, there's just one connections per, per agent. But for small world, there's two. One of them is the same as for ring lattice, namely connections per agent. The other is the neighbor link fraction. This is basically asking what fraction of connections are within your ring lattice network and what fraction are global connections. So in other words, this fraction, 0.95, is local. It's purely to your, to your ring lattice neighbors. 5%, 1 minus point uh, 0.95 or 100% minus 95%, remaining 5% are global. So if we were to look at that and I were to lay this out, what would be the natural way to lay this out? If I want to see a small world network and I want to see what fraction works my neighbors and what fraction are global, what's the natural layout type to use? Can anyone tell me? How would you lay this out? If I want to, if I want to see this most naturally, 95% of my connections are with my neighbors in a ring line of sense. What should I use to lay it out? A ring. Yeah, you'd use a ring. Um, okay, so here we have a ring. We're going to run this. And there we go. 95% are local. And 5% are global. These are the global ones spanning it. These are the local ones. And this is designed to capture, it's proposed by Duncan Watts, a student of Steve Strogatz, I believe. Um, and 
basically it's something which captures the fact that in human systems we have a lot of local connections, connections to family, connections to neighbors and in our neighborhoods, and then we have some global connections, connections to people across the world, connections to people across the country, um, which are more global. So it allows some amount of both, and this can lead to mostly local dissemination, it's sort of particularly over here right now, but eventually it may start to disseminate more broad. So any questions about this before we stop for today? Okay, so, so next time what we're going to take a look at is uh, some extensions of this. I think we'll look at dynamic populations in dynamic networks. How do we add connections and how do we add people to the population? How do we, or agents, how do we delete agents from the population? How do we delete connections? And soon we'll go into movement. How do we move people across those landscapes? Either in, in a discrete sort of way or in a continuous sort of fashion. Okay, um, so uh, those are the um, comments I'll have. I'll, I'll come back to the issue of dynamic networks uh, in a little bit. Okay, so uh, thanks very much, and we'll resume on Monday. Incidentally, I've been going over. Um, uh, I've, I've been going over the. Uh, Bit of the uh, problem set, uh, pro problem set ones, uh, causal loop diagrams. Uh, those require a little bit more judgment, and so I've been trying to provide the TA some extra guidance. We'll try to get back those back to you as soon as possible. However, I, I want to say that I'm quite pleased with those that I've seen. Um, I think you, you know people put in some some uh, good reflections and thoughts and observations on those. So. We'll try to get back those back to you soon, and um, and then problem set two as well. Um, those who are having trouble with any logic and the any logic key, are there any remaining issues with that? Are those all resolved now? For any logic, anyone still having problems with any logic? No. Okay. Good. Thanks.